Let's talk about real sword use and some of the fantasies that sword collectors hold. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator and Eastern Antique Arms. Now what I'm holding here is an absolutely massive oversized version of a British Napoleonic era 1796 light cavalry sabre. I'm holding this for a reason. What is that reason? Well, something I've noticed, I am a sword practitioner, so for 25 years I've been practicing historical swordsmanship. Before that I practiced modern fencing and in fact kung fu and a few other things as well. So I have a long history of sword and other weapon use. In addition to that, I'm an antique arms dealer. As you may know, some of these things here behind me are in my collection and I've got other swords dotted all around me. So for more than uh, 20 years, I've also been collecting antique swords and uh, in recent years, I've been dealing as well. Um, so I split my time pretty much between YouTube and antique dealing. Now, one of the things I've noticed is that antique sword collectors, people that collect the things like this behind me, very often are looking for the unusual. They're very often looking for that, that sacred, uh, uh, very rare, unusual variant of a sword or something that's rather out of the ordinary. I'll just grab another sword here. If we stick with the 1796 theme, this is the famous Osborne and Gunby variant with a clipped um, point, uh, better adapted for thrusting. We'll talk more about that in a future video. Um, and indeed, things like this giant 1796 light cavalry saber. How giant is this? Is incidentally, it has a 37 and a half inch blade. That's 95 centimeters for the uh, metric amongst you. Uh, so it's just massively oversized. Now, often when we talk about um, antique swords or any swords from history, really, we could apply this to ancient world or medieval world swords as well. We get, as sword collectors and people with lots of things in our collection, we get particularly excited by the outliers, by the particularly broad, the particularly long, sometimes the particularly light or particularly heavy, um, because we have lots of them, okay? We have lots of these swords and we like the things which are unusual. And for those of us like me, who are really into Victorian era swords, we get very excited about a patent solid hilt or a flat solid blade or one of these one of these variations that everyone in auction bids very high on to try and get into their collection. But actually, when you boil it down to the user, to the end user, are most of these things actually good? Do they actually make the sword a better sword? And I'm here to tell you that fundamentally, the answer is, if not always, it's very often no. <laughs> Quite simply, is this massive 37 and a half inch bladed, so that's like, what is that, five inches longer than a normal 1796 like cavalry saber, is because this has got a bigger blade, it is broader and it's longer, and although it's quite light for its size, it is therefore a little bit heavier as well, does that make it better? Does the extra, does the extra blade size compensate for something? Does it make you feel more secure? Uh, is, is this a better weapon? N no, not really. Is it better at anything? Well, we can categorically say, yes, it's got more reach. A longer blade has more reach. And there are some specific situations where this can be useful. Clearly, if you have um, an armed force equipped with 14 foot pikes and they come up against an armed force armed with 17 foot pikes, the people with 17 foot pikes are gonna have on average, a slightly better uh, better go of the fight, aren't they? They're gonna have a slight advantage over the ones with slightly shorter pikes. In a very simplistic and basic way, this does also apply to some extent in certain styles of fencing, I suppose. There was a trend towards longer and longer rapier blades at a certain point in certain parts of Europe, in England, for example, um, and in certain countries, England, I believe Spain as well, um, at certain points there were actually edicts, laws that came in to limit the length of rapier blades because it was just getting ridiculous and it was annoying people in court. This famously happened under Queen Elizabeth I. So clearly there is at least a perceived advantage in sometimes having a longer blade. There's also a discussion during the Napoleonic period, and this is where this sword becomes relevant, that the long 
cuirassiers, the French cuirassiers, um, swords of about 30 inch, 80 inch blades used for thrusting were advantageous and difficult to fight against when you had a light cavalry sabre with only a 32 or 33 inch blade because you were several inches shorter and you were trying to cut with it. Remember that when you thrust, you hit with this bit. When you cut, you cut down around here somewhere. So if you're trying to cut at someone with a 33 inch bladed sword, you're hitting them about maybe 28 inches up from your hand and they're poking you with 38 inches of um, heavy cavalry point. Um, so yes, in some situations, reach can be an advantage. However, that reach often comes with big disadvantages. So with this sword, using this as, as our example for this video, yes, the advantage is reach. Now, what are the disadvantages? They are many. Uh, the primary and most important one to a swordsman and as a practitioner of saber of military saber fencing based on 18th and 19th century sources is that it makes it far less wieldable. Would I like to use this in an average sword fight? Hell no, <laughs> because it's just too big. It's too big and unwieldy and unmanageable. Are you going to have that one trick pony of that extra reach? Does it mean that you'll be able to leg snipe or head snipe maybe slightly more easily? Yes, it does. However, everything else pretty much is disadvantaged. It's slower to defend with. Um, it's slower to move around. It's more tiring. Um, it, it, changing cuts. If I want to do a feint and then a real cut um, to, to successfully land the cut on the opponent who's defending themselves, it makes it harder and more cumbersome to do that with the, with the longer and slightly heavier blade, with the uh, inertia further from the hand, this kind of thing. So generally speaking, it is just far less wieldable. And this is true if we look at the French cuirassier swords. So if we compare a, a normal version of a 1796 light cavalry sabre, if we were fencing on foot, so we're not on horses, we're not charging, we're not doing none of this, it's just one-on-one -on -one fighting on foot. One person has a French cuirassier sword and the other person has a 1796 light cavalry sabre. I would say on average the person with the 1796 light cavalry sabre is going to have the advantage of the fight because the French cuirassier sword is a big, long, heavy, cumbersome sword that doesn't work very well used as a combat sword on foot. Surprise, surprise, there aren't many swords used on foot that balance and weigh this, similar to a French cuirassier sword because they were built for a specific purpose for sitting on large horses and, develop, um, and delivering a heavy cavalry charge. So different swords are built for different purposes and some swords are better at fulfilling a multitude of roles and some swords are more specialised. If we come back to the Victorian swords for a second, does a patent solid hilt or patent solid tang as they're sometimes known, so full width tang, does it inherently make the sword better to fight with? No, it makes no difference whatsoever. And some people have argued, I, don't, I think this is a bit unfair, but some people have argued it's just a sales gimmick. Now, I don't fully think that's true, but I think it's partially true. It has a, it has a whiff of truth about it. And the fact is that a patent solid tang, a full width tang, is mechanically stronger, okay? It's, it's more laborious to make, it's more costly to make, therefore more expensive, therefore more elite, more status. It's a showing off thing. But it does make for a slightly, it does make for an indestructible tang, basically. It means if your sword's going to break, it ain't going to break in the tang because that's the thickest bit of metal in the whole sword. Okay, so it does make an indestructible tang. But, and I've made this point in previous videos, a normal tang still does the job. So all of your typical cavalry have got a normal uh, tang on their sword, at least up until 1853 when they got a patent tang. Um, but all of your regular officers have got a normal tang on there on the officer's swords and they're fine. They're perfectly strong. Just the same as most medieval swords have that type of tang going through the grip. It works fine. It works well enough. Okay, so it works well enough to do the job. Equally, the blades, if we look at the various different types of blades, the slightly broader blades, longer blades, um, heavier or lighter blades, br um, you know, different cross sections of blades. Some are fullered, some are unfullered, or some have a different type of fuller. These actually are relatively small details. When you're having a sword fight, what it really comes down to, yes, length is there. The weight of the sword is very noticeable, the weight and balance, they go hand in hand, and just the general wieldability of it. Okay, how easy can you use this sword? 
Most of these swords, really, when you're talking about different cross sections or difference of hilt detail, it is just that. It is just details. Um, so whether you've got a patent solid hilt or a normal tang, you don't really notice the difference once someone's trying to kill you and you're trying to hit them. Or if you were just fencing competitively, you wouldn't really notice the difference. Equally, if the cross section of your blade is a flat solid blade, which I love, um, and they do cut a bit better, or it's a normal 1845 fullard blade, at the end of the day, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. To actually fight with, it doesn't make that much difference. Yes, the flat solid will cut slightly better, but it's slightly more flexible in the thrust. The fullard blade is probably more durable, uh, but both of them, if you hit someone hard in the neck with a sharp one, it will partly sever their neck. If you hit someone hard in the wrist with one, it will partly or fully sever the wrist. They will both fundamentally do the same job. So to conclude, without wittering, wittering on too much, I hope you've got the basic idea. I think sometimes sword collectors who don't actually use swords very much, and this isn't a criticism, but I think they fetishize and fantasize about these odd variants or particularly long ones or particularly broad ones or particularly curved ones. And that's because they're collectors. And I'm one of those as well, okay? I'm not making this into a them and us situation. I'm both of these things, okay? I use swords and I collect them. Do I get happy when I find a particularly unusual sword which is very long or very broad or very heavy or very light? Yes, I do. I'm exactly like all those other collectors. It excites me as well from a collecting point of view. When I come to choose a sword to actually fence with against someone who's a good fencer, when I pick up a practice military saber to fight another person who's using a practice military saber, and they're gonna try and hit me as many times as they can, and I'm gonna try and hit them as many times as I can, each of us while not, you know, while trying not to get hit, in other words, we're fighting or fencing, what do I pick? I pick the sword that I can ensure the greatest success rate with. And that usually means one that's not too long, one that's not too short, one that's not too heavy or too light or too broad. I usually pick something that's somewhere in the middle, uh, just with a few small details tweaked to my particular tastes, you know, the shape of the grip, the point of balance, things like this. But by and large, I don't pick the outliers. Outliers in history are outliers for a reason. It's because they don't work for most people most of the time. They're outliers because they're not statistically very successful. I hope this has been thought provoking. Uh, your views posted below, always of interest to me and hopefully I'll get a chance to reply to some of them as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers folks.